This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. To the highway, in a brand new day, gotta let it go. So open the voice gate for september 27 2022 we are members of the voices of wrestling podcast network you can find our show on the voices of wrestling podcast feed or on our own dedicated podcast feed on all podcast platforms and applications you can follow us on twitter at open voice gate if you'd like to donate to the show click the link in the show notes it'll take you to our redcircle.com landing page you click the red box this is sponsor this podcast and you can set up a one-time or reoccurring donation no obligation whatsoever, but we would like to thank all of our previous donors. I'm one of your hosts. It's your old pal, Iron Mike Spears, joined alongside returning Case Low. Case, how's it going, bud? You know, Mike, I said moments before we started recording, I said, hey, my apartment is kind of eerily quiet right now. I'm going to pop open my balcony door just for my own sake, even if it doesn't make sense from an audio perspective to have like ambiance going on. And as soon as you started talking, shoot church bells went off in the distance and I had to close the door immediately. So so we are off to a rough start today. <laughs> um, what, what, what can I say? Uh, thank you for holding down the fort last week. I realized it was a very bad week for me to miss, but I was I was dealing with shoot job obligations that prevented me from watching a Japanese wrestling pay-per-view in a timely fashion. And that is a real shame. Hey, I, I'm more wondering what the what the church bells are going off at set at 6 p.m. Chicago time for. Like, is it is just a top of the hour thing that picked up there? Or is there a feast going on in your neighborhood? The, you know, they did have their feast day this past weekend, which I, I don't. This is a Catholic church. I grew up Catholic. I I'm not currently practicing, but this church intrigues me because one. During the Chicago Pride Festival, they march on the uh, like a block over, like on the adjacent street, sort of. And I got a little nervous that there were going to be like picket signs outside of this Catholic church, uh, you know, telling people they would burn in hell, et cetera, et cetera. There was not. They actually seemed to be pretty supportive over the entire matter. And then they had what appeared to be some sort of feast day on uh, this past Saturday, and they had a DJ. And then a live band and, and all of this other stuff that seemed to be very uncatholic, which I appreciate as somebody who, despite growing up relatively normal, I mean, people have listened to this podcast, they can make their own judgment call there. But at the very least, I have normal parents who are normal, uh, uh, very nice people. But we did grow up going to a Catholic church in which during one of our uh, celebrations, the song Same Love by Macklemore came on the speaker, and that became a scandal because we had to turn that song off. So I, I don't know why, to answer your question in a very roundabout way, I don't know why church bells are going off right now. It could just be a daily mass. It could be because when you're not recording a podcast, it actually sounds relatively pretty. I don't know the answer to that. I, I will try to get to the bottom of it for next week. You know, that's the reporting we need. We need really niche uh, micro a uh, local reporting about Chicago suburbs. That's oh, what well, we need. I, I have to get to, you know, I have to be on the ground. I have to talk to the people if I'm going to make something happen here. So really it, it, it's the least I can do. It's not that this is, I, I certainly don't claim to be a journalist by any means. I don't believe you do. Uh, we are a very reactionary show and I will be reacting to the church bells going off. Just give me seven days. Now uh, I'm going to use that as a segue case because Please. we, we we talked about reacting, and if you caught last week's episode, I ended the episode talking about a bit of, of news, or at that time it was rumors that over the week I said I kind of want to wait and see how it played out, and on Friday we had the official word that Naruki Doi is going exclusive freelance and is going to be out of wrestling. It seems like up until 
uh, gate at Destiny. But a lot of this case news was like breaking while you were away doing shoot job stuff. But first and foremost, like Dangerous Gate, Naruki Toy now going freelance, the overall kind of just question marks around Aita. I, I just kind of want to get your response over the last uh, week of, of all the happenings that's been happening around Dragon Gate. Yeah, I guess I never really gave my thoughts on Dangerous Gate in the public setting. So let me just back up really quick and note that I adored the Twin Gate match. I adored the Dream Gate match. I thought the Triangle Gate match for what it was was a ton of fun. And I thought Natural Vibes versus Zebrats and that two-part eight-man tag I thought that was all a ton of fun. There was a lot of stuff to like on this show. Even the undercard, you know, there were a few matches in there that didn't mean a ton, but I, I thought they never overstayed their welcome. I thought actually the Kondo and Awashi versus Super Shenlong and Ho-Ho Loon match was a ton of fun for what it was, you know, a meaningless eight-minute undercard tag team match. I really enjoyed uh, the way those two teams worked together. So going into Dangerous Gate, I was incredibly excited for this show. I thought the card looked good. I, I I hope that we conveyed that in our preview for this show that, hey, there's a lot of stuff on this show that matters. You know, don't be fooled into thinking that high end versus gold class is just another six man tag. Don't be fooled into thinking natural vibes versus Zebras is just another eight man tag and recognize that you have a 20 year old in Mochizuki Jr. and Ishinihashi, a very young, very talented 25-year-old, I, th I think he turns 25 next month, recognized that these guys were in the semi-main event of a show that ended up outdrawing last year's Dangerous Gate year over year. So I, I came in incredibly excited. I left incredibly excited. And over the past week, and I, I will once again clarify because I feel like, like I said at the top of the show, we're a very reactionary show. I, in particular, have taken umbrage which a, with a lot of surrounding media member statements about this promotion this year, and I'm going to do the same this week, and I want to clarify up top, but it's not directed to any one particular person nor podcast, and I also think I have an issue this week just as much with the chatter surrounding this promotion – as the lack of chatter surrounding this promotion. And, and maybe we can come to some sort of happy medium. Maybe I'm too invested. Maybe I'm looking at this not from a, a, an, an eject, objective enough point of view. But I feel like people have lost their minds when they are talking about the current state of Drangate. I have no idea what's going on in people's minds. I have no idea what they're seeing nor analyzing. I am so incredibly confused at how we can be at September, about to flip the calendar over to October in 2022. And you cannot look at the, the growth that this promotion has had as anything but a positive. I, I won't even say growth. I will say the changes in this promotion as anything but a positive. I am dumbfounded by some of the things that I'm seeing and some of the things that I don't think they are getting praised enough for. And uh, we'll discuss that in a minute. But off the top, sort of big picture thoughts uh, on your end, Mike. Yeah, it's something that, you know, with it being a Monday show, now it's seven days away, and discourse and, and all of that around Dragon Gate. I, I think something that, Case, we've talked about for years that we have to just fully just say, like, it's already happened, is a generation shift has been happening for the last three years, and that's fully, and, and that's fully on board right now if you look at okay, eight uh, of the previous generation, but you work your way down the card out drawing last year's show. So the direction is the, is something that I think that people have to kind of acknowledge that this company is different because it had to be different because the generation changed. And it's something that, you know, since Yoshino retired, like it's it's come just fast. And, and it's not been like immediate it's not been everyone at once but the generation change now has fully cemented i think as of last week and i think i'm just i'm just surprised at the fact that this generational change which you're exactly right and and i looked at this and, and i will continue to pat myself on the back i looked in at the start of 2019 and i said there's there's something happening here there, there's a bit of a different energy to this promotion it's not this radical change from, you know, Shima Fuji Susumu or Shingo Hulk Tozawa. 
But there's something happening here that's a little bit different. And a lot of those guys were lumped into the rookie ranking tournament. And as we've gone on, those names were joined by SB Kento and by Jackie Funky Kame. And then, you know, we've seen Fujiwara and Ishin and now Mochizuki Jr. joined the fray. This is a promotion that you're exactly right. We're not in the midst of a generational change. The, the generational change has happened and it's not experimental. It, it, Business-wise, just looking at raw data, it's a change that is working. Now, I, I will note, and I note this when we're talking about Wrestling Observer Newsletter Hall of Fame stuff, and I will note this here, that I think drawing is very relative. I, I don't necessarily like comparing drawing records of somebody in the 70s or 80s to somebody in the 2000s or 2010s. And I do think in a very micro level, it's really hard to compare the attendance or the drawing record of somebody in 2013, 2014, 2015 to what we've seen over the last three years, which ultimately this is a generational change that has taken place over the entire course of the pandemic. And, and we'll see if they're able to escape uh, on a permanent basis in November with Gate of Destiny or if we have to go back to clap crowds a little bit after that. I don't know about you, Mike. What, what, what's your COVID check right now in your neck of the woods? Because in Chicago, it's starting to get bad again. Uh, actually, I think because of how reporting is, I just assume it's the it, it's as bad, if not just like about to ramp up for the fall. You know, I mean, do, do you think that that South Carolina has continued reporting as vociferously as as Chicago or no, Illinois? Because no, because I, I don't I don't even think Chicago is doing that good of a job of it. So if we're not, yeah. there's no way that uh that South Carolina is. But in terms of Drangate, going back to what I was talking about. Th this change has already happened, and I'm a little blown away that there aren't more people praising this. And I understand that Drangate is just one of those things, given the streaming service, given, I, I guess, what could be daunting for a new fan, the complicated nature of this promotion, that, that more people aren't recognizing this. But we're living in a reality right now where the, the current Open the Dreamgate champion is 28 years old. You have an Open the Brave Gate champion who is 25, an Open the Triangle Gate champion who is 20, and then Triangle Gate champions, one of whom turns 28 next month, one of whom turned 23 last week. That is the core of this promotion. That is the heart and the soul. And it's not like these guys are drawing 700, 800 fans to Cork and Hall and we're, we're rubbing our hands together going, you see the potential is there, just give it time. Year over year, there's growth there. I mean, this show with Eita and Yoshioka on top outdrew a Yamato show last year, and I think that's really, really relevant. Like, this is not only happening, but it's working. And I'm really confused on what the disconnect is in, in a larger English-speaking sense because it's, the, it's what Drangate has always done. This is what they do better than anybody. I came on this show a month ago, Mike, and I said – for from 2021 to 2022 have we witnessed the single greatest year of talent development in wrestling history and i was serious at the time it was a genuine thought that i had and after watching the last month of shows after seeing what mochizuki jr and ishinihashi did uh, at dangerous gate and now seeing what kaito nagato is capable of i'm going i don't i actually think this is more feasible than i thought originally this might be the single greatest year of rookie talent development that i've ever seen and that's not even talking about your already established stars, your Shun Skywalkers, your Ben Kays. This promotion is loaded. And for some reason, there seems to be this disconnect, uh, whether they're, they're buying into this idea that there's chaos and terror backstage, which I think there's some validity to, and I think some of it is overblown, or if they just can't recognize stars because they weren't on the back of Drangate USA DVDs. I don't know what the problem is, but Drangate is doing everything they've always done well. They're just, they're, they happen to be doing it at an accelerated pace right now. So I think that there's kind of two ways to tackle what you're saying, Case. Uh, 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 about discourse or lack thereof and it, it's something that i take more of a holistic kind of view at discourse and about how wrestling kind of i don't say operates but at least how discourse operates and you you know there's so much oxygen that's eaten up by cyber fight promotions and by bushy road promotions that have like the full force you uh just conglomerate push that i think that Dragon Gate just being Dragon Gate at this point. It's just like 
there's machines at play. And I don't think that, that I'm being like conspiratorial when I say this. I mean, the, the, we are, we've seen Bushi road basically uh, transform the face of uh, Joshi wrestling just from uh, just with give empowering them with the cash infusion and taking the talent they had and poaching what they needed. Like that, the, it, it's a machine in progress. I think that bites into that. And I do really think that I, I, I think there is a disconnect that exists with uh, international virgin uh, international fans and native fans. And I think a lot of that is somewhat for the international fans. You have 2006 being that big bolt of exposure and that continues up. And then they have DG USA for the next four years after that. And I think there is some of that in play, but I also think that because of that being in play in the past, if this makes sense, I think that that they think that there has to be these kind of figures that are there where I think what we have truly seen now more so than individually is the collective draw of the Dragon Gate brand at this point. And I think that that's really what's persevering more so than Yoshioka, who, I mean, I've mentioned countless times, just look in the crowd. He had the, the fans have taken to decourage, but I think that as a part of the overall rapper, case of dragon gate i think that that's what's really has succeeded that the fans are willing to say oh this is remaining dragon gate this is still dragon gate it may be a little different but still a dragon gate and that was always going to be the big challenge in this generation shift i think you bring up a few good points there i i get very annoyed when people refer to dragon gate as an indie company because i think they say it with a negative connotation but that is exactly what they are. They're an independent company that is fighting against Bushi Road and Cyber Agent. And I feel like it's worth noting that pro wrestling Noah's Cork and Hall crowds are much closer to what 2AW does than what Drangate does. So their ability to keep their head above water without being able to draw full capacity crowds for three years now is incredible and i think that should be celebrated the point about the brand being the draw this is something that you and i have talked about on the show a few times i largely agree with this theory although i will continue to note that yoshioka while champion after the abysmal kobe world ultimo dragon 35th anniversary show yoshioka wins the belt attendance immediately shoots up Pandemic record in Corican Hall, pandemic record in Kobe Sambo Hall, pandemic record in Osaka number two, year over year up in Oda City Gymnasium. I think that sort of stuff matters just because Yoshioka is an unproven first time open the Dreamgate champion. But would you say, and I'm going to go in a roundabout direction here, try to stick with me, but when Shima and T Hawk and Lindemann and, and Yamamura left in 2018, do you think we saw that attendance dip that we did because Shima left and he was, you know, obviously such a massive star or if it was really the first time since the Ultimo split that the Drangate brand as we know it had sort of gotten rocked and that people weren't sure what this promotion was going to be going forward? I think it's both. I think that, and I think that this also play will play with Naruki Doya a little bit with him being exclusive freelance and not being at every show. I, I think that some of the initial drip drop has to be Shima's draw. I mean, Shima is of a generation that has fan clubs. And in case you, you, you can just like look at Cork and Hall and you see the banners, those are fan club banners, like the, like those sort of things. So there was some of that, that somewhat recovered and recovered over time definitely did but i think that there is something to say about you know a company that yeah there were some things that happened between 2004 and 2018 of course but i mean there, there weren't like departures other than agani so very quickly so i think that that there is something that that was like the ship was taking on water when it hadn't for such a long time and i think there might i i think there's merit to to that kind of discouraging uh, attendance. I, I want to talk about the departures for a second, but I also don't want to cut you off. Do you have anything more to add here? Can we go through the list of names that have left the promotion this year? Yeah, I think that I I mean, we'll, we'll talk about Doi more so in this. So yeah, that's all I really had to, to 
to really reflect on at least over the last seven days. Yeah, let's talk about okay. the departure. Right. I just, I, that, was, that was a good point. I want to make sure you got all that out. So let's table Doi for a second. Before Naruki Doi left, the names lost this year. And please tell me if I if I forgot anybody, but I think I got everybody. Kaito Ishida, Kaisuke Yakuda, Kness, Super Shisa, Gamma, Riki Hashi, Shoya Sato. Am I forgetting anybody on that list? No, you're not. I said... This is this is just this is what gets me is that I don't think people are thinking very logically about this departure where you can lump these into a few different categories of yeah okay so, so let's put them in buckets let's put them in buckets because I think that that's the right way to do this with these people so um, you've got you've, you've got your rookies you've got Ricky Hashi and you've got Shoya Sato other than local business that Sato was going to draw by bringing in his students for house shows do you think there was any business lost with those two exiting. I think that, and I don't think it's going to be a big business change, but I think if you if you have Ricky in there for that match instead of Don Fuji on the, the at Dangerous Gate, I think that that might have moved maybe a couple dozen more tickets because there were a lot of like uh, Koji Ishin Ricky fans at these two shows. So having him there, I think, would have been a little bit of a draw, but not anything to call home about. Yeah, I, I, for as much as I enjoyed him, and I think you're right to that point, for as much as I enjoyed Ricky Ihashi, we never saw a definitive data, nor was he around long enough to really impact any sort of box office impact that he might have had had he stayed. So I agree with your points there. You've got the legends. You've got Kness, Super Shisa, Gamma. Did we lose any box office money, any sort of big impact loss with those guys leaving? <sighs> I mean, Gamma, like, weirdly might be the one <laughs> at this point because Gamma, like, promotes shows in Osaka. L like, he has had his fingers in a lot of pots for so long, so I think that he helped when he showed up, but he only showed up for TV. So it w would only be those shows that already were to that. But, I mean, when you talk about these three wrestlers, you're, you talk about the reality of of spots and places on cards and, you know, where things are now. Would it be fair to say there? It, it that's more of a sentimental loss than a business loss. I think that other than Shisa in a dojo, but I think that people think that Super Shisa was in a dojo a lot longer than he was. Yes, I, 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 I yes, <laughs> it's uh, you know, the the Dragon Gate roster itself has not only been the the thing to to change and flow and invite new names and kick out old names over the last year. The dojo is is keeping on pace with that. So I, yes, we're on the same page there. I'm gonna give you the floor on this one. Kaisuke Akuda did it impact business at all when he left? Not whatsoever. Not really. No, no. I mean, if anything, it actually helped certain people's merchandise business that he left. I, I would say Ben K lost a friend, but he might've gained a paycheck uh, with Akuda's exit because Akuda's exit has helped Ben K so tremendously. He was dragging Ben K down. I liked the Ben K team. I would have liked to have, would have liked for them to have explored that in a twin gate capacity, but it was very clear in the moment. It was very clear from the fan reports that I was getting from shows. And it's really apparent now that Akuda is no longer in the picture that he was not a guy that the audience connected with. And I think him leaving has actually been a net positive for Dragon Gate. Yeah. And it's something that I think that that's right there. The native versus international disparity at play. I think that a lot of people had a lot of love and we did for the Brave Gate feud that he had, but it, but I mean, it wasn't like that that was a huge draw, really, at that time. And, you know, the fans never connected to Okuda. Like, that's just the 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 the, the short of it. it. It The marked improvement for Benkei and the fact that now Benkei suddenly has, a per has discovered personality, I think, is a net huge positive. That means Okuda leaving. Look, we adored that Brave Gate feud in 2020 with Akuda and Nishida. I, I, again, I enjoyed Akuda as a wrestler, but I'm just looking at things from an objective point of view, and I don't think him leaving has any sort of drastic impact. We said it the day he left. I'll, I'll say it again. I think time has only gone on to prove that. Kaito Ishida leaving, and I'm very, very curious to see what that October 9th Gleet Cork and Hall show does that will have Ishida making his debut. I think June Kasai is in the main event of that show. You know, we'll see what happens there. But Kaito Ishida, your thoughts on him leaving from a business point of view? Uh, 
there was a little evidence about him and him locally in Osaka. And and there was runaway for him in Osaka. Like I think that there, that that out of everyone, he is the person that been like would have loved to see what have happened with that. But I, I, I mean, comparatively, I don't think that it's been a business loss either. No, I, I think, and this is what I said when he left, and I, and I again think it's become more apparent as time has gone on. That that is a loss that is going to hurt more in the short term than in the long term because if they weren't going down the round of yoshioka seemingly wanting to challenge former dreamgate champions i think as is on the level you could build him up for a month he could be a, a credible dreamgate contender in a mid-sized building i think in his hometown Sh- in his hometown you know possibly in front of clap crowds or in front of vocal crowds rather at gate of destiny uh i think as the roster continues to thin with fujiwara and shun and sb kento and estrella and then soon yamato and for a weekend ben k as that roster thins ashita's presence as a work rate guy is going to be missed but i don't get the feeling that in quarter two of next year let's say that you and i are going to be scratching our heads and drangi it's going to be over in japan looking dumbfounded going god if we only had kaito ashita right now i i don't look at that as being a future issue for them yeah and it's something that also with ishida like who knows like if if it's something where he's only working very select dates and is doing whatever else in his life like it it, it, if that has to come into conversation as well it's like oh if, if he's kind of moved past wrestling like you know then it's just like oh if it's either going to be flaming out in tw- in twelve months in kind of this manner, or is it going to be a big blow up? You take the you, you take the blow up that's going to happen, and it's going to be out of your hands, right? Yeah, I think so. You know, I, him and Gleed is going to be really interesting because I I do lend credence to the idea that you know Ishida was never looked at as the top guy in Dragon Gate, but he was a guy that meant something for the promotion, which I I've never denied. That August twenty fourth Corkin show. That had Kento Miyahara on it, and Miyahara is a name that I'll bring up in just a second again. It had Kento Miyahara on it, it had El Lindemann versus Duki in a title match, and it had Masada Yoshino uh, awarding the new G-Infinity tag team titles to the first ever champions. That show did 723 fans, and I think you and I were way down on that number compared to most people, but I look at the profile that Lindemann has been given in New Japan this year, the way they have set him up for success, which if you're going on paper, I don't know if I would change anything they've done with Lindemann this year. Unfortunately, these matches are not wrestled on paper, and and you know the attendance hasn't correlated to such a degree. You bring in Miyahara, you have Lindemann doing what he's doing, and you bring in Masato Yoshino. And I mentioned this in the Voices of Wrestling Discord, and I got pushback on it. I didn't respond to the thread. I'll bring this up now. I said to have those three things, in particular Yoshino coming in, and drawing 723 fans, I think that is a really bad look for Gleed. And somebody responded, I don't know who it was, but they said, oh, you know, please be real. Masato Yoshino is coming in for commentary. Nobody's buying a ticket to watch Masato Yoshino do commentary. I am going to reject that notion. They wouldn't have brought Yoshino in if they didn't think he would mean something. And it was the first wrestling appearance of Yoshino since his retirement, which drew a huge, massive crowd to Kobe, uh, Kobe Kinnon Hall last August. If that doesn't boost numbers to a degree, I think you have either failed to market Yoshino properly or your promotion is slowly encroaching on dead on arrival type status. Yeah, like if you if Yoshino is only there for commentary, you're not going to be having posters of him up. The, the, no, they, yeah, no, they, exactly. Yoshino <laughs> has become a, a core figure of this promotion. And yeah. it's not we're we're not seeing changes. And that is you can say, oh, he's a retired wrestler or whatever, but they they clearly see value in Yoshino, and I don't know if they're getting a huge return on their investment or not. I mean, I I would if Drangi well, well, case if, if you ahead. want to bring it back even more, like they've been bringing in like Kenta Kabashi and been drawing like that. Like And I weirdly certain... think, and this this is this is a half baked idea. I can be talked out of this. Do you think Masada Yoshino means more to the Gleek crowd, the people that are going to buy tickets to see Shima, El and Seahawks, than Kenta Kobashi does? Man, that's a tricky question. 
that but no no i mean okay. Ken, all right uh, Kento, I, idea. It, it, I can be talked out of yeah, that. yeah 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 man kenta kabashi was actually a crossover figure at a level uh masada yoshino means more to like the fans that maybe have left and or are continuing to follow strong hearts it's like oh now now we can see yoshino too that's cool like i think that that's a draw but not to the level of Ken, of kenta kabashi all right fair enough I, I i'm on board with that all of this to say this is a long way of getting to Naruki Doi announced that he's going freelance. We'll be working select dates with Dragon Gate and seemingly other promotions going forward. I don't think this Doi news is that big of a deal. I, I don't think it affects the day-to-day operation of this promotion. I, I really think, and I and I kind of alluded to this earlier, I think this might mean more to people that own Dragon Gate USA DVDs than anybody else. And and by the way, people are are more than allowed to have that opinion. I think that's totally okay, but I do think your finger is off the pulse. I was going to say a little bit, but I'll actually go ahead and say to a great degree. I think your finger is way off the pulse if you are freaking out about Naruki Doi. One, not leaving the company in any sort of heated manner. He is working with Dragon Gate on a freelance deal that has been compared to what Magnitude Kishiwada and Shuji Kondo have worked on in the past or currently. If you look at the way Ishida left, there was a statement in the middle of the night, moved on, he's never been spoken of again. Doi announces he's leaving. Everybody posts their favorite Naruki Doi memories. They wish him the best of luck on social media. He'll be back again soon. This is almost like the Drangate equivalent of fear-mongering, where you go, well, if Naruki Doi is going to go freelance, then what happens next? I don't know. They're probably going to draw a, a big number for Gate of Destiny. Yuki Oshioka is going to sell more t-shirts. Mochizuki Jr. is going to evolve into one of the best rookies we've ever seen. Like, I know it doesn't matter. Naruki Doi does not matter to the day-to-day parts of this promotion anymore. And if you think that, then you are behind the times. You need to adapt. It, it It's something that, so... The term being used is exclusive freelancer or preferred. I, I've seen both being used in either in translations or like that. And it's something that for all the buildup like case, it like let's take the macro view. Like, like take our steps back and just like if you were presented the uh, the Naruki Doi that we've had since he lost the Open the Dream Gate title to Ada in August of 2020. If you take a look at these last two years, you would think that it's someone on the way out. And then you look at how things are changing. This has been like a gradual decline of Naruki Doi, both as his appearances, both both health and booking, like those are both worth mentioning. It's both health, both worth booking, have been on a decline to like a, a rate now that I think it's very clear at this point that there, there is a lot less Naruki Doi matches ahead of him than there are behind him. And I think that if you take a step back and you look at the last two years, you start seeing that very, very apparently clear. Off the top of your head, do you know how old Doi is? 43, I think. He is 41, so close. I'm going to give you a half, a half point for that because the fact that any of us would know that is psychotic. But Doi is 41 years old, and I feel like in any other time, in any other promotion— phasing out a 41 year old from the main event scene when you have and i will reiterate a Dreamgate champion who is 28 a brave gate champion who is 25 a triangle gate champion who is 20 and then a 28 year old and a 23 year old pair of twin gate champions phasing out the 40 year old should be looked at as a milestone accomplishment of self-awareness and of progressive thinking and booking And I don't know if it's because Nozawa worked nine matches for the promotion this year and everybody just fucking lost their mind. I don't know what's happening. I don't understand why this is. Doi leaving is good for the promotion. We talked about it with Jay when he was on in July. This is not the the promotion of Yamato and Doi and Shingo anymore. You know, it it of course Yamato's over. Doi is respected, but the intel that we have is that Doi's not over like he once was. So move aside. Let SB Kento do his thing. Let Shun Skywalker do his thing. Get out of there, Doi. You are in your 40s at this point. And as Japanese wrestling veers into a continuously and I I would say rather scarily unhealthy scene of legends continuing to lead the way 
in not paving the way for young guys, especially in Noah, again, Cork and Hall crowds closer to 2AW than Drangate. This is the type of thing that we should really take a step back and go, whatever business deal they made, maybe this is just a front. Maybe there is heat with Doyle, though I really doubt that there is. This is the sort of stuff that should be applauded. This is a promotion that Naruki Dory is a two-time Dreamgate champion. He is the most accomplished tag team wrestler in the history of the promotion, multiple-time Triangle Gate champion, multiple-time Brave Gate champion. He is 41 years old. And Drangate goes, you know, we don't need him on every show. We have the depth, we have the talent, we have the stars, whether it's in the individual or the brand, to say we just don't need Naruki Doi around all the time now. And that is a remarkable feat. That does not happen without hard work, without commitment to these young guys, and obviously, you know, their talent development is second to none. It just, the idea that this is anything but a progressive step forward, I don't know. I have a really hard time grasping another thought process on this. I it's something that I think that with uh, where the company is at and uh, again let's talk uh, let's talk big picture let's talk environmental about this and I because because I think you cannot talk about Dragon Gate without like talking about how the wrestling industry is moving and it is something that you look at Dragon Gate their dojo just constantly is pumping out kids and eventually like with COVID like this like. The way that they operated had to change with that in some fashions. And it's something that, I mean, Case, remember like 2019 when every show had a Dragon Rumble? Like they yeah. every single show because there's just too many people on the roster and they had too many people that are being booked there. And not only does that hurt cards because you get battle royals instead of like eight man tags, but you also are hurting talent development because you're not going to – I think that – yeah, like even not as a wrestler, I think it's fair to say that you are going to get more out of your development in a singles match with uh, with whomever or, or Yuzushi Kanda over like 90 seconds at Battle Royal too. So it's something that it, it's like these spots are more and more kind of precious the more and more people you put out. And as these people are getting older and when you like look at things like this, like being able to say, okay, we really need to start shifting these parts because this is not like a thing that just suddenly happens. This is something that is an ongoing process that like, you have to like look at how things are going to go with this promotion. And, it, and that's kind of how after Kobe world we're like, now we're almost two months out from Kobe world. And we were like, well, the next six months are going to be the unfun ones, but now we know, but we know what's going to be like 10 years down the line. And that's kind of what we're seeing. And that's what we've seen over the last eight months. Yeah. You and I were really anxious about what, what Q3 and Q4 of this year were going to look like given just the, the atrocity that was July of 2022. But if this is the dark timeline that we're living in, if this is the promotion that is without SB Kento for the rest of the year, without Fujiwara until TBD, without Shun Skywalker for a month and a half, and with a number of not unproven youngsters, but fresh faces that still need some time to develop, even though they are still very talented, if this is the rough patch... And this is the point that you always make. I mean, what what are they going to be at five years from now? And I'll remind everybody that not all of these kids are going to land. These guys are going to get hurt. They're going to have a gimmick that doesn't catch on, i.e. Coach Minora. Their, their growth is going to stunt. Not all of these guys are going to hit, but other than New Japan, whose archaic young lion system gets these guys back to Japan with a proper gimmick at 35, 36, 37, I just can't fathom anybody with a better five-year plan than Drangate has right now. I mean, do you know how, off the top of your head, well, we did the Doi game. Do you know how old uh, Kento Miyahara is? Oh, geez. He's in his 40s. Mike, Kento Miyahara, and I have to double-check now just to be sure. I am correct. He's 33 years old. 
they have run that guy hard, put away wet for 33 if that, years. If that is not the most 45-year-old, 33-year-old man you have ever seen, I mean— He's younger than I am. The, what, what 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 do you do if you're all Japan? Like they've got the kid that Nagata loves, and maybe he jump, but th- maybe he jumps ship and goes to New Japan because Nagata loves him so much. Like, what do you do? Noah sacrificed their entire future for KG Muto. Again, Cork and Hall numbers closer to two AW than Dragon Gate. I get it. Kaito Kiyomi is twenty six. Congratulations, you put all of your all of your chips on the table with him, and now he's doing Keiji Muda cosplay. I don't think that's the future you want. I don't think that's going to be a positive uh, a five year plan for you guys. DDT. I wish him the best. I'm very confused on their business right now. I I don't totally get what's going on there but i also you know there was so much talk in ddt for a long time with takesha and with endo and with higuchi of like ah it, the next generation like watch these kids and i and maybe and this is where i'll admit that maybe my finger is off the pulse but i don't know if ddt has those young guys lined up anymore like i ddt's five-year plan is just a question mark like it's a frowny face for all japan it's fear for noah it's a big thumbs up and a smiley face for Dragon Gate, and it is an un- undeniable question mark for DDT. I don't know what's going on there. But Kento Miyahara, Mike, he's 33 years old. You, what? You didn't, give a, you didn't give a smiley face to New Japan. I'm, I'm actually intrigued now. What, what, uh, what emoji are you giving New Japan right now? Look, they employ Kazuchiko Okada, and as long as that man is on atop the company, I think that's going to be a smiley face. I'm also incredibly bullish on Yui Uemura. I think he can waltz back into Japan and become a big star. So uh, it's a it's a smiley face. Hmm, how do I want to how do I want to phrase this? <laughs> they're like a nice guy that I'm not interested in. Like they're a co like, hey, he's nice, but I don't like I don't want to see him outside of work. Like New Japan, I want to parachute in for the big Shingo matches. I want to parachute in for the big Okada matches. I'm going to parachute in for the big Osprey matches, but I don't I don't have investment in New Japan at this point. And I think people that do are kind of weird. Fair enough. I, mine would be a little anxious looking at the watch. The thing sense. is, the thing is with New Japan, and I, I, I complimented this. I complimented them so much on this before the pandemic, and obviously, just time has become so weird. I think we forget how many young guys, and I use young in air quotes because of the way they do things, but how many young guys they have in different places around the world. And if they all took a jet back to Tokyo tomorrow, I think we would go, holy shit, there's a lot of guys on this roster and a lot of guys that are good. And and I, I will always grant them a bit of leeway there. Now, again, the way they do things you and I don't agree with, it doesn't seem like new Japan agrees with it anymore. They have completely aped the dragon system talent development schedule, uh, which I'm more than happy about, but they just have so many guys in so many places that it's a numbers game. And I think one or two of those guys will have to hit. Yeah. And I would have to say that if there's anyone that can take someone who might not be that top player, but give them the sheen that they look like the top player or get people to believe that I, I would trust Bushi road more so than anyone else. Yeah. I mean, I don't, you know, I, this is yeah. not the, this is not the time nor place, but, what has cyber agent done i mean you can say okay well they've kept these promotions alive and i will give you the chris hardwick points for that one but you know what what else have they done they've they've popped some inflated budokan numbers that's awesome i you know i i'm i'm much more invested in the promotion regardless of the in-ring style regardless of my fandom i just think having a promotion that can consistently draw throughout the country whether they're in tokyo or osaka or Kyoto, or I'm trying to think, uh, support uh, Hokkaido. You know, Dragon Gate goes to all of these little spots throughout the country, and they matter to those people. And that's why you see this influx of trainees. Is for some of these people, Dragon Gate is the wrestling that they know because Dragon Gate is the only people that bother with their small little village. And I think that is so much more impressive and so much more engaging than, hey, we put an old guy in Budokan Hall. Awesome. Yeah, it, it, it's just two completely different strategies when it really boils down to it. I mean, when you look at, like, traditional touring in Japan, like, it's very few companies actually really do tours anymore. So it's just we, – we've you, you see, it, like, how Japan has gone with, like, population, and it makes sense, but it's something that there's something to be said about long-term longevity, about going and focusing on Tohoku like they had, or – now they have a guy, a kid from Fukuoka, and it's just it's one of those things that I mean when you talk about some of these people leaving, like I, 
like if people want to know the brass tacks, nuts and bolts, where's where is Naruki Doi gonna really hurt drawing? Case, where is he gonna really hurt drawing? Nara. His hometown. Yes, he is like of a certain generation that had fan clubs. Yes, he does still have like a certain sheen about him, but he it, it's something that I think that that's points to the brand that other than like the hometown guys at this point, it, it's really been traveling on the Dragon Gate brand for so long. And I think that that's what we're kind of seeing here. And I think with Doi, I I just honest case, uh, do you think Naruki Doi will be wrestling? N- n- not part time. I'm saying wrestling in general in five years. No, I I mean th- the way that that this was explained to us, or I guess not explained, but rather the conversation we were having with somebody this morning was. This is a way for Doi to prolong his career before he inevitably has to retire because his body is in horrible shape. And if this means he can go work Gleet without the the Dragon Gate office heat, then great. He found a, a way to backdoor into wrestling Shima again. Awesome. But I think this is body preserving more than anything else. Yeah, and, and it's something that he was someone that even like not to the level that he's now advertised it for, but he's someone that worked as a physical trainer for a while and he kept it up now. And it was something that was pointed out to us that like, he's now like actively physical training. So that's something that was always known as like his post wrestling kind of gig was like, he had like all these accreditations. And if you go look at social media, that's what he's talking about with that. And it's something with like the exclusive freelance, we didn't really talk, too much about that case and i think that's something that i think is really worth getting into when we talk about naruki doi about this and about the idea of freelances that has happened a way more than people realize with dragon gate over the last 15 years well like i said i mean the, the textbook example there is what shuji kondo was doing right now and what magnitude kishiwata had done in the past and those are guys that you know kishiwata was was pushed heavily now i don't know if he was well, okay, you answer me this. If you know, when Kishiwata came into the promotion, my understanding, he was contracted as a Dragon Gate wrestler, then left, then came back as a freelance guy. Is that correct? There was a period that I know that he was contracted, but for the, for the vast period of his tenure in Dragon Gate, it was as an exclusive freelancer. And basically, exclusive freelancer, you think about Suji Kondo, like that's the idea. If you think about Kai before COVID, that's also the same yeah. idea. Yep, there that's that's a very good example as well. So But probably again, less with Doi. Probably a lot less. It, it's not this acrimonious split. It's not Doi giving the two fingers and the stunner to Ultimo Dragon backstage. And and you know, I, I've said since he came into the company, I'm increasingly concerned about the power that Ultimo Dragon has amassed. And we've certainly seen Ultimo's fingerprints sort of revert this promotion back to 2003 uh, in ways that I don't entirely love. But the core of this promotion is the same. Like they just keep chugging along. And when people get hung up on five minute Toro Washi undercard matches, or just in general, when people go, ah, it's just not the same. It's like, I'd, I'd love, I'd love to know what that means to people. Because look, if it's just, Hey, I like Dragon Gate because I like Shingo and Tozawa. I get it. I'm not, I'm not going to argue with it there, but if you want to go deeper into this promotion, again, I, I said this earlier, but I'll reemphasize it. They're doing the same things they've always done. They produce young talent better than anybody. They tell more cohesive and in-depth stories uh, than any other promotion in wrestling. And they're wrestling, Although maybe it doesn't peak as high as the tippy top New Japan stuff, and I'll, I'll I'll be very kind and throw in the top end AEW stuff as well. The baseline for this promotion, Mike, do you think there's been a talent drop off? Do you think the worst matches uh, of 2022 Drangate are worse than they were five years ago? No, uh, I I I would say though that. There is a propensity, though, of having certain matches you can just immediately zone out of that I don't think it necessarily was the case five years ago. I, I I don't think you're wrong. I also think you and I have to remember we watch every match of every show, and I am about 80% on the YouTube uploads this year as well. So we are consuming stuff I, arguably more than we should, depending on who you ask. Uh, but we're... we're, we're consuming stuff at such a rapid rate i don't think even you know if you go back to 2016 
the beloved year and rightfully so we were getting half of the the content that we're getting today so i see your point i do think the scales are a little bit different there yeah i i guess like the thing i'm thinking about you watch more youtube than i do but i look at basically now every single show there will be a match that's just everyone playing the hits and maybe that is if we were just watching cork and it's like hey this is the guy that you see the the he's doing the thing we, we got kinky thrower band attack we got we got all the things happening in this match here but it's something that i think it, it, if you're someone who is actively following the promotion i i, I it, it's something that i would have to say is probably a detriment at a certain point i think that's fair i i think that's fair uh do you have any thoughts on Ata, I, I know you discussed him at the end of the podcast last week. Any yeah. any opinion changes? Any news that you have that I'm I'm unaware of? So I, it it's something that I I know that now people are now more openly talking about Ata's position. I think the the verses where I was last week, where I was just like, I want to see what's going to happen on Friday, and then with Ata, nothing happened. But also, there's no TV coming up for Dragon Gate until next week, so it's something that. I'm still kind of in a holding pattern. I do think that we, if you just look at this at a purely Dragon Gate centric point of view, if he's there for the shows that moving merch and the things that matter, if he's not like going to be full time and doing like full unit stuff there, but he's still going to show up to Tokyo shows and big five shows. I just, at this point, you, you know, he is a different cat, and what he might want to do might not make sense for the rest of us, but I think Dragon Gate, at a certain point, you, you're going to have to kind of take what you can get out of Ata and what he wants to do. I, I would say as long as he is still actively a part, of, wanting to be a part of the promotion, which from every conversation I've had with anyone has been very clear. It's like, yeah, no, there's no there's no acrimony or anything like that. It's just, it's just something that I think we're going to be seeing a new future with Ata and things might be different. And I think that that's a safe thing to say right now. I don't think I'm going to get in trouble for that. No, no, you, you always worry about getting in trouble on this show. And I, I, I don't think, I don't think you have to worry about that in any instance, but especially this one, uh, going back to what we just said, overload of content, perhaps skewing our view a little bit. Would seeing Ata half as much as we see him now, not be a net positive for everybody involved. If he's not, it, if it's Peros Ata half as much, I think it's perfect. If it's going to be Peros Ata every TV, then I'm going to want to see less of that, to be quite honest. If it's doing this, you know? Yeah, I really I really don't know what his next step is. You know, I, I, I wasn't on here last week to talk about Dangerous Gate, but I got so angry watching that main event because Ata is such a brilliant pro wrestler. I mean, he's so good at doing certain things. And to think, like, I didn't enjoy him in Antios. I really thought Pac saved his ass for the first year of R.E.D. And then once Pac left, he assumed the leadership position in a pretty pleasing way. But I just, I think we're living in the worst possible timeline of Ata. Like, if you run his career back a hundred times, half of those times he doesn't get on the flight to go back to Japan and he's living in Mexico and he's happy there and he's doing interesting things that yeah. you know you can watch on like the Cubs Twitch channel. There's I think 49 versions of him where he really dedicates himself to Drangate. A fire is lit under his ass when Shima T-Hawk and Lindemann leave. And not that that didn't happen, but I, I think there's but I just I just want him to be a babyface fucking junior heavyweight. I just that's all I want. And I, I think there's versions of that out there. And we just happen to get walk and brawl Preto uh, Preto inspired Ata. And yeah, that's look, I get and it. I think that's what we're going to be seeing. If you're going to ask me in the next five years, I think he's going to be playing uh paraguay jr as much as possible and it's not that, it's not even horrible to. like no. it's not it's not the worst thing ever. look in the phases of ata's career this is far from my least favorite i'll take this all the time over 2018 2019 ata it's just like God. 2015 ata too yeah i take yes. this over it too it's just you watch him against yoshioka and it's 
why why is it this in his entire career of doing these cool you know heavyweight style matches but junior heavyweight style moves in this really compact and engaging 25 minute main event the fact that that isn't his entire career just kills me because he has the talent to do so and he has really chosen not to <laughs> i mean yeah but I, I i do think it's worth saying that i think i think the next five years for Aita, like if we're talking about this in like this kind of context i think hey this will be like that the the, the Aita that's the most personally fulfilled in a weird way like he, he'll be doing exactly what he wants to do it just might not be what anyone else kind of wants him to be doing no, I mean that's I I think you're exactly right. He he seems to be stoked on being able to work Noah Jr. matches and then coming in and doing whatever in Dragon Gate. I I I really tried to approach this episode in the most objective way I can. I will say subjectively as a fan, not getting a satisfying payoff to Ata leaving RED and becoming a babyface that sucked a lot of enjoyment out of my spring and summer of this year. And I talked about that with Jay when he was on right before Kobe world of just like, God, it felt like we were really onto something that Ata Maria story was really interesting. And I kept on waiting for whether it was strong machine Jay or whoever else to form a unit around Ata and to sort of have this ragtag group of misfits as a viable baby face unit and right when it seemed like we were getting to the point where that story was going to be told, he latched himself onto Peros. And, you know, my, my point on Peros is, look, you don't have to like him here, but they had really good matches in Dragon Gate. That 626 Triangle Gate match against Natural Vibes is a fucking awesome match. And, and I don't love the prospect of seeing Nozawa ever, but in Dragon Gate... They were really, really inoffensive, and your mileage may vary on the Kobe World stuff, but my opinion is the Ultimo versus Santos singles match was sad. It was two old guys not being able to do what they wanted to do until Peros came in and saved the day, so even that stuff is a net positive. I'm just frustrated that it took away from what could have been a really interesting summer of Ata. Yeah, and I think that that's kind of the thing. <laughs> it, it, it's just the opportunity cost there would have been something that i mean hey like if we want to talk year to year like they got an eight to big five main event before <laughs> like if you want to look at like the drawing posts there like they cashed in that chip with eight to, you know so maybe it is the time that hey he gets to go work no as much as he wants and shows up to tv i i think that or like tokyo based stuff or you know he might go he, would you be surprised to see Ata like whenever like he announces whatever like whatever things shake out with Ata, not announcement, however things shake out with Ata, if, if if and again, we're just talking here. I don't know anything special. If if his uh, position in Dragon Gate is going to change, would you be just as surprised? Would you be surprised at all like he randomly shows up at an IWRG or a AAA show this time next like a less than a month after an announcement. No, no, he could show up on AAA tomorrow, wouldn't shock me. That's what he wants to do, and that's great. I think he'd be great there. I would watch AAA if Ata was wrestling there. I think that'd be a lot of fun. I think he could have a lot of fresh, interesting matchups. I, I No, it, whatever deal appears to be out there for Ata, and again, nothing is official, but there's a lot of chatter about it. I think that deal's going to be, he's going to go back and work in Mexico some, and, I, and I'm, I'm happy for him. I, I think that's rad. So, no, I, I, I think AAA, and quite frankly, as a pushed commodity in AAA, I think it'd be a very realistic future for him. Yeah, so it, it, it's something that, again, like we are, he hasn't been announced for anything over after this Kobe show from Friday. There's no TV until the 6th, so... It's just, it's the end of the month, so we, and they're just doing house shows, and he wasn't necessarily working every house show to begin with. So there's really nothing to read into until next month, I think. I want to get your thoughts real quick, because I kind of know where you stand, but I, I, I guess I don't entirely. Just big picture, you know, some of the stuff I talked about at the top of the show of, I, I don't think Drangate is getting the credit they deserve for their young talent development. I know where you stand on their five-year plan, but just temperature check right now where where are you at with dragon gate what do you like what do you dislike i i think the title pictures are all good i think m3k you're going to be doing this m3k run long enough 
until you think Junior can go by himself. So I think that there's still mileage with that there, and especially the the fact that they still are not willing to to like move on from Ishinahashi with them. Like that instantly has become something really interesting. It, it it's something that like vibe check overall. It's considering how July was entering October in a state where Yuki Oshioka has been the crowd is accepting Yuki Oshioka. They they did the thing I thought case that, that if I wasn't a coward I would have gone on all in on and on wanting to end that show with D Courage and Kakuda just draped in gold and it's working. So I, I couldn't like the- I couldn't believe the result of the twin gate match. Again, I you know I didn't write the review. <laughs> I wasn't here last week. I, I mean I, I called I, it- on- uh, you you absolutely called it, and I really thank God there's not Dragon Gate on DraftKings because I would have put a ton of money on Jason and Jackie winning that match. I was I I was stunned. That was the one match that I was unspoiled on watching. Oddly enough, I was stunned at the result when I watched that. Yeah, so I think you have like with with Dai and Kakuda. I mean. That's not going to be a. I don't think we're going to see a Yamadoi run out of them. So like, but uh, like it's going to be. It, it's something that I look at this from like. Okay, how are we cementing Kakuda now that he has a direction? And I'm encouraged by that. Uh, Hyo is Bravegate champion. I mean, you look at the rest of the lineup. You need to have a heel champion there. Hyo definitely. You know, he's delivered as champion so far. I'm interested to see where the route goes with that Jason title match. And I'm I'm really excited for that. I think that's going to yeah. be good stuff. Yeah, and then you look at Natural Vibes and Zebrats. We know what the end point will be, and it's something that they took something that sometimes is very played out and the Dragon Royal, and they made that into the Zebrats versus Natural Vibes match on Friday. And I thought that, that was something that's like, okay, we're continuing to stoke that flame because they have to figure out, or they have to stall until, until Shun comes back. And I was not encouraged by fake Skywalker, but I was encouraged by the stuff I saw on Kobet. It, it remind me, I, I listened to your audio, but I don't remember if you discussed this or not. Did you give a theory as to who fake Skywalker is? Well, at this point, I think it's just whoever looks most like Shun they can put under a mask. I don't okay. think that there's intention on fake Shun Skywalker. Do you think it could possibly be some way to debut Yoshiki Kato, who is the other guy from the Nagano, Nishikawa, Mochizuki Jr. future class? Uh, I don't know if Kato's at that point. I don't think you you would interject Kato straight in on that unless you think he was already at that point. But we we as we've learned through the future classes, you can't really determine anything from like that shoot wrestling. I just like look at this as a way that they're trying to kill time, and they chose fake Shun, which now has people speculate. When I think if we saw a uh, Metal Warrior or Doctor Doctor Muscle, we'd all kind of be like, oh okay, and then. You know, down the line, it, it's like, oh, Shun's back, and Metal Warrior removes his mask, and there's another masked man behind it. I think that that would have achieved it without, you know, just like the the, the fact that Jay f- and, and Ho felt like they had to. It wasn't Ho Ho on that match, but that Jay felt like he was like, oh, it's force projection to describe that. Just no, no, I hate that. I see your point. I like that though, because I, I don't know. I don't know where it's going. I'm really intrigued by it, actually. I'm I'm glad they didn't do a Metal Warrior or Dr. Muscle here. I like that it's that it's a mysterious Shun Skywalker that appears, because I really don't know how they're going to get out of it. Yeah, like, you kind of have to now have a way to get out of it, or you go like, oh, it's just a someone that, like, fake Shun is, like, a decoy, and then Shun's right behind the person that, they're, that he's re- returning against. Like, you either have to have something in mind, or you're just never going to unmask this. Like the the you 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 have to know what you're doing about this thing. Like I the, that's the thing that kind of I just think that it just doesn't matter in a way because it's just going to be a way that to kill time till Shun's back. I hope it's one of his friends from Mexico. I don't know. Are are you familiar with this Luchador uh, Radioactivo? Yeah, Radioactivo has really started to pop off. I feel like. Yeah, he's wrestled the Drangit guys a few different times, and I really enjoy his work. I've I I'm. I I found myself at a point, and I I've said this, you know, in the rare instances where I watch anything that isn't contemporary wrestling, I I watch a lot of '90s lucha now. But even in my my contemporary viewing, it's Drangate. Uh, I I'm trying to get caught up on all the Osprey stuff. I'm pretty close there. I watch AEW every week, but for pleasure, like if I'm not just like, oh, I heard this is a great match, I need to watch this or F- FSM 50 stuff. 
I'm watching Lucha more than I ever have before. I'm watching big companies. I'm watching indies. I'm just, I'm a changed man. I I wouldn't have imagined this five years ago that I'd be as into the Lucha as I am right now. And Radioactivo is one of those guys where I I really get a kick out of him every time I see him. I I hope he gets the, uh, this guy was nice to me in Mexico. Thus, he is getting a (laughs) Drangate tour tour because I think he could shine if he was given the chance. Yeah, like that's something that I'm gonna be really interested in to see to, to see who all comes back with them. You know, they, they always bring someone back home. And Ra- Radioactiva, at least so far out of people I've seen, and, and I also think it's something that I've when they've like shown up with like big lucha people, I've really tried to pay attention to that. But like the IWRG stuff of Nishikawa at this point, I'm like, okay, I, this is just not working. <laughs> you know, I'm so intrigued by Nishikawa because. If you if you line him and Nagano up and you say, okay, guess which one of these guys are going to start their careers in Mexico, it would not be Nishikawa, who was as big as Shun Skywalker, if not bigger. I mean, that is a big dude, especially in the context of this roster. He is very rough around the edges. We have to remember he's wrestled at this point maybe less than five matches in front of a crowd. He's very rough around the edges. But his size and the fact that they are shipping him off to Mexico before he actually debuts in Japan, I, I just I that is a name that you are going to want to pay attention to. Whether or not his matches are good is irrelevant to me when he makes tape and his must watch stuff. Yeah, it's something that's that this stuff right now is the thing we look back in five years like, hey, remember when he, they just kind of dropped him in Mexico for the first for like the first year of his career and just kind of was weird like that that's what this is going to be it's gonna be a footnote and if you have not seen it the uh, it is fujiwara and uh, nishikawa against shun skywalker and the former drastic boy this is up on the drangate network i i recommend that match because one it's a reminder of like oh my god fujiwara is so good it's ridiculous but also shun skywalker has so much fun wrestling in mexico and if you're into what shun has done this year that match is worth your time yeah he's going for chuck taylor's record i think with with crowd work (laughs) he's he's incredible he is uh other than will osprey the best wrestler in the world this year yeah for sure. And it's something that I have a backlog of, at least the U.S. stuff, and I need to get to that. I think it's something with our schedule. We might have a buffet day coming up for us. So It might be next week. You're right. Yeah. Uh, we do have one show that happened this week that we've gone an hour before talking about, and that's kind of been by design. I, I would say it was the the Friday Kobe Sambo Hall show. This was the show of which they announced Nuriki Doi moving to exclusive freelancer status. We had some other things happen on this show as well, but uh, got to be honest, this was not their best outing in the home base for a while. I, I think this is one of the worst shows they've had there probably all year. It's just nothing really happened. Yeah, from a broadcaster's point of view, it would have been really nice to go on this hour-long diatribe about how healthy the promotion is and then to be able to go and look no further than this Kobe Sambo Hall show, but that is unfortunately not the case. Yeah, so we're probably going to, I don't say zip through it. We'll talk about the stuff we've really no, enjoyed. No, we're, we're, we're going to zip through it. We're, we're going to zip through this. All right, then. In case, I'm going to run down results, and then we'll start going through the stuff we liked on the show. Should that be how we handle it right now? Uh, I've got some stuff I dislike that I'm going to want to talk about. All right, I like that, too. All right, so the opener, 10-man tag team match, M3K, Misaki Mochizuki, Susumu Mochizuki, Yazushi Kanda, Mochizuki Jr., and new associate, Ishinahashi win their first match as a fivesome against the assorted team of Eita, Kinki Horiguchi, Takashi Yoshida, Doka Kakuta, and Kaito Nagano. Uh, Ishinahashi debuted the Komada Choke Slam, which is now one of my favorite moves in wrestling. It is a flapjack that he picks them pretty much straight up and then stops all motion and goes straight down to the mat. It, it, it made Nagano squish on the mat really good there. Uh, I, this is something actually a, a lot to kind of talk about. Ishin and Mochizuki Jr. not letting what happened at Dangerous Gate be a changing point. These two kids still don't like each other at all, Case. I, I love the way they've handled this. It, it, to your point, great new finisher from Ishinihashi. Mochizuki Jr. and Ishinihashi, I am 
obsessed with the dichotomy these two guys have where you're exactly right it, it's it's classic dragon gate booking these guys are going to be side-eyeing each other for the rest of their careers and i think they they could be swimming in cash at some point a few years down the line neither guy is ready for it yet but a few years down the line a twin gate mochizuki jr ishini hashi you know the the sons of great wrestlers twin gate team I think is something that they're going to run with. And I think it's something that is going to be super successful. And even then, if it's five years down the line, talk about that five year plan, they are still going to be side eyeing each other from the July, August, September, October feud that they had. It it is, it is such good stuff. This was a really fun opener. I I wasn't totally sure about the idea of Ishini Hashi joining M3K. I kind of, wanted them to leave that untouched and just have the young mochizuki in there with the originals but through one outing i'm i'm down with ishin at least being affiliated in some form or fashion with this group yeah i think it's something that m3k needed to have another young body around given touring schedules i so having ishin there and ishin needed to he he's no longer a rookie you you know like he had his rookie storyline it was time to get in place so even if it was something that it eventually like Mochizuki and Ishin and like have like another clash or they get that they, they get on the same page, it, it was something that I think is going to pay off for them. And I think if M3K is going to be a permanent entity, they needed to have more younger people part of it. And Ishin makes as much sense of anyone right now. I think that's fair. I, I think that's exactly it. If M3K is going to stick around, they have to be a little bit younger. I can't argue that point. Uh, and so I'm 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 for Ishin being saddled alongside them. I do have one note that I had a question to ask you. Does Kaito Nagano have that dog in him? <laughs> oh, Mike, he got that dog in him. Okay, I was just making sure. It was something that, like, w- when I was putting forth, I was like, how are we going to talk about this show? And I didn't realize we would probably talk this much about uh, the state of Dragon Gate ahead of time. I did have a game that I asked you, uh, all the young wrestlers, which ones have the dog in them, which ones don't. Because I would say this, uh, Nagano has it. Uh, Minorita does not. No, Minorita, Min- does, Min- not. Minorita does not have the dog. Min- Minorita, Minorita got that puppy energy. Yeah, very much so. But I, I, I like seeing Nagano in this. Like, it's something that like his path is very clear. But he's doing what he needs to do right now, and I, I've enjoyed it so far. Yeah, I think, I think all Japan would kill to have kaito nagano or at least a guy like him a young guy as exciting as he is on the roster it's just, and he's just he's just another guy like like i don't want to reiterate my points but you know nagano just came in and debuted he crushed it with kai and assimilated himself really really quickly into the general day-to-day operations of this company and they just they have so many guys that i don't even think you and i maybe have never necessarily given him the time that he deserves and and it will come with time but Still, it's the the future is so bright here. Match two, uh, Ultimo Dragon team with Problem Dragon. They beat Konamao Ichikawa and Don Fuji. The, uh, the it, it was a lariat from Fuji. The finish was the best part of this match. So Ichikawa was popping Germans and was going to do the lariat assisted one, and he ha- he held up Monday Ryu. Monday Ryu ate the uh, clothesline, but then fell backwards onto uh, Soccer Ichikawa to win it for Ultimo, and dude, they did like a three-minute woke rope walk spot in this match. Three minutes of that. I think Joe Gagne is the one that posted the finish to his Twitter, and that is really all you need to see here. Uh, Kog Tora defeated former high-end member Binke in Binke's first single match since uh, joining uh, uh, Gold Class with the Gurumakakari. Binke then promptly... Uh, Brain bustered him, cut a promo, said chicky, 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 and left. I did not like this match, and I really wanted to because I thought the build to it was excellent. I was really into Kagatora specifically taking up an issue with Ben K. Ben is just doing phenomenal work right now. I didn't think the match was that good, and I didn't like that Kagatora won, so this left me very cold. It was kind of plotting, too. Yeah, it, I would have liked to have seen this match done in half the time and just have Ben try to kill, 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 and Kagatora do what he does best, which is evade, and then, you know, you get a flash pin finish right there. But it wasn't even a flash pin finish. My Kagatora pinned him clean with his finish. Yeah, that was weird. That was weird. Uh, right after, and something you could have done, because right after that was the remainder of gold class, you could have had Manorita 
get involved for that. Like you could have made it flow a little bit so it didn't feel as uh, plotting, but Gold Class versus the Kung Fu Masters of Ho Ho Lun and Super Shenlong the Third, along with Punch Dominaga, Naruki Doi wins his final match before announcing his exclusive uh, freelancership with uh, the Bakhtari sliding kick on Punch Tomonaga. Uh, does not make me feel good long-term about Kung Fu Masters that they're a team of Punch Tomonaga. She took the words right out of my mouth. I, I understand that Kung Fu Masters don't exactly have the vitriol nor intensity that, say, Blood Generation had, but I think there's something to this unit, and I wish they wouldn't team them up with Punch. They, they were in... They were in a funky match last month, too. Let me see if I can find it really quick. Um, but it was something where I just kind of felt like, wow, do we really do we really have to do this? I can't find it. Maybe maybe I'm making things up now. Um, I swear punch team with them last month, too. Maybe not. Okay. Anyways, I don't like that they teamed up with punch this month. I, I think it's a bad look for the unit, and I, I did not enjoy that aspect. I will say... Despite Punch being in this match, I actually thought this was pretty good uh, because Kung Fu Masters are very good, and we got a, a fair amount of Naruki Doi wrestling here, which I thought was nice. Yeah, especially considering how uh, transparent he was at Dangerous Gate. Other than doing a face-off against Yamato, it was nice to see him getting these like matchups at the very least. Uh, Minorita got got the nunchucks, and that's something that I feel like the, that has some legs, to be honest. I, I, I think that they that there might be some... Maybe the maybe Kagator has joined the Kung Fu Masters and we're going Kung Fu Masters versus Gold Class and Kobe. Maybe that's that's something I but I do like these pairings together. Like the match this was, other than the opener, the best thing on the show to this point by far. Shin Long is a good wrestler, even throughout all the injuries that the person under that mask has suffered over the past few years. The Shin Long character itself is pretty enjoyable. I, I really, like, like I said, I thought that Ho Ho and Shin Long versus Kano in a Washi match on the undercard of Danger Skate was a really strong undercard match, specifically the stuff that, that Shin Long and Ho Ho were doing against Kondo. So I still see value in this unit. I, I still see a future where Kung Fu Masters are a countrywide unit rather than just Kobe specific, but we will see as time goes on. After our mission, we had the Royal Sanbo. As I mentioned, this was basically Z Brass versus Natural Vibes. You had KZ, Big Boss, Shimizu, UT, uh, Strong Machine, J, Jackie Funky, Kame, Jason Lee, Kai, BB Hulk, Hio, Diamante, and Alejandro from Pro Wrestling Noah. Alejandro won the match. And the other notable thing that happened is that Jason set a uh, pent Hio during the Royal Sanbo to set up a brave challenge for next month in this building. I hate this fucking Noah show. Oh my God. And it's nothing against pro wrestling Noah. It's just that I hate this show so much. Where where are you at vibe check on the Dragon Gate Noah crossover show? If it's a way to get Alejandro out of Noah into Dragon Gate, I think that the, uh, the ends will uh, uh, be worth the mains for just Alejandro. To be quiet. I like Alejandro. Like straight up, I, I don't think he had a great performance in this match, but I don't think this match was really set up that for him to succeed. I think if you would have told me that a week ago, I would have been on board. And then I saw Alejandro eliminate Diamante, who is probably one of the five most protected guys on this roster, maybe one of the three most protected guys on this roster. And I went, mm, don't like that at all. Doesn't annoy me quite as much as Yamato having to sink down to the Noah Jr. level and wrestle Seki Yoshioka, which makes me irate as a Dragon Gate fan. But I, I did not, did not enjoy the inclusion of Alejandro here. Again, very talented wrestler under normal circumstances could waltz into Drangate tomorrow. And I think he would fit in. Okay. But being the pro wrestling Noah guy and seeing him eliminate Diamante did not like that one bit. And the match kind of died death after Jason was eliminated too. Like the crowd wasn't really into Alejandro showing up to begin with. No, no, that's, I mean, that's that's what I'm I guess I'm confused about is other than Nozawa, who is the Strangate show for? Because the Drangate fans don't care. I think the I don't I don't know if the Noah fans do or not. I don't really get the impression. And look, it's you know, for for as much as this podcast has been about, hey, Drangate's not all that different than it was fifteen years ago. This isn't exactly Mitsuhara Masawa's pro wrestling Noah. I think that is fair to say that that company has evolved and changed quite a bit, but I still don't get the impression that anybody really cares about their junior roster. 
so I don't know who this show is for. And I, I, you and I are both on record as saying that the Drangate standalone Cork and Hall show two days later will be out drawing this Noah Drangate crossover show. Yeah, yeah, nothing has really changed about that, in my opinion. I just, I guess it just gets a good number for Cork and for them, maybe. Like I don't even know if it just, this will even draw a thousand. I don't point. think it will. Like that's no. my. I think it's like a under eight hundred show. I I think will it draw? Will it draw more? Will it draw more than the average Noah, Noah Cork and Hall show, which is like five thirty? And I'm not exaggerating. I think it's it's like their average attendance is like five thirty six hundred in Cork and Hall. I think it will draw more than that. But no, oh no, this show's not touching a thousand fans. Oh my god, absolutely not. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it, it it's something that then in the post match they set up Alejandro, uh, Daya. Oh no, they set that up after the main event. But it just was something that, that at that point it's like, oh, Alejandro's here and he won this match. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I I'm gonna be in a very grumpy mood when we review that show <laughs> because I just I just I can't believe and this is I think this makes them look bad as a business. I can't believe that five time Open the Dreamgate champion Yamato is going to have to wrestle Noah Jr. on that show, and they're going to work it like a 50-50 match. I think that is horrible. I am so annoyed that that is taking place. It, it, it's something that I... The oral history is going to be fascinating about that. I just, like, 850 is what I'm expecting on it, and I just hope that no one gets hurt, really. <laughs> I, 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 we'll see closer, too. I mean, let the record yeah. show. I, I did sort of nail the dangerous gate attendance. Uh, I, I was right in that ballpark when we I predicted that two weeks ago. But I'm I'm looking at this as like a 700 fan cork and haul outing. This will do gleet numbers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the main event of Kobe was D-Courage versus High End. It was Yuki Oshoka and Dragon Daya defeating Yamato and Dragon Kid when Yoshioka pinned dragon kid with the frog splash the clear next direction for yuki oshioka is going to be a motto and i think we could probably pencil that in there for uh ed on arena Osaka at the beginning of november but they did not confirm it but that seems to be the direction it's going to be a nice full circle moment on this podcast as i talk about the finish of this match in which a 28 year old open the dreamgate champion pins dragon kid in the main event of a kobe sambo hall show and i think we all went yep business as usual because everything keeps going in this promotion and we are at that adapt or die point for a lot of dragon gate viewers where you either have to realize that this is not the future this is the now this is happening and these guys are not only beating the likes of yamato and dragon kid but they're doing it and people that are plugged in aren't really batting an eyelash at it like this was just like yep yoshioka won as he should have he pinned dragon kid as he should have on to the next show this is what's happening adapt or die this is what's happening in dragon gate right now you know, Madam Tokyo is not walking through that door. <laughs> Choco Flo Kobe is not walking through that door. But Mike, Solar. Mike, how how can I enjoy a Dragon Gate pay per view if Toru Washi's working a pay per view once every quarter? It just, I don't see how the promotion can be good if that's happening. I mean, sometimes you have to eat your vegetables, get your dessert. You know, if you view him as a vegetable, then you get to it to watch. A to B, this fantastic territorial heel in this main event. It, it, it ends justify the means on that show. We should have done the show sounding like we were half asleep because that seems to be compelling audio for some people. It's, yeah, but um, it, it, it's, I, it, it's something that when I look at this company, I think to kind of like as you said, go back f- full circle with this is the thing that we talked about that we thought was happening. Yeah, it was happening, but it was happening at a pace that even the two of us did not really take the step back and go like, wow, this is, we are in this next generation. And when you like look at this show and you look at the fact that really outside of Hulk, who is Hulk at this point, no one like, you have to go deep down the card just to, f- to find the Torreon originals. And I mean, that's just kind of the world we're in right now. It's the people that, you you know, the, the timeless ones. And it's something that we, we will see more and more, probably more people drift off 
through this happening. It's the one thing I will say though is that I I do understand the fact that it just feels like it's one hit after another. I do totally get that as something that bothers me. Yeah, people. but like we talked about, like the people that have left don't mean anything. It's if if Yamato and Shun and Mochizuki leave, I'm going to tug my collar and go, oh shit, this podcast is going to get really interesting. I don't know what the next next few months are going to hold, but it's just, I like, I love Super Shisa. Desert Island Wrestler for me, but him leaving doesn't affect the entity, like what this promotion is. And it's just, I think people have have really poorly analyzed this promotion you know from reddit and beyond this year i i think people have really missed the boat on what is exactly going on which is that this generational change happened under a lot of people's noses and it's been more successful than i think people want to give them credit for uh you know are they neck and neck with stardom yeah again i'm gonna give the edge to Gate just because of how they draw throughout the country but uh, you know, again, you look at, you know, the DDT All Japan Noah Collective and they're just they're, there's no argument that they're they're as successful as Drangate is from obviously from a talent development standpoint, but from a business standpoint, I just don't see it. And it's something that like the whole stardom conversation, like I guess like I always came from the fact of that that everything should have been happening a lot faster for stardom too so it's like oh stardom we're still having this conversation at this point with that because like they, they had every advantage in the world there but dragon gate doesn't change dragon gate's still the number two men's promotion in the country and that's not changing and it's something that i think that we've really seen now clear evidence that and and, and you you address this a little bit but i i want to get your thoughts more so about this before we close out here, I think we are, we're now really at a point that this is Dragon Gate, the company that when we talk about like what's drawing people in there at this point, it's Dragon Gate, the company that comes to your hometown, the, the, the company that it's not just like, it's not just like Dragon Gate Ross members, like almost all of Joshi, like, like you talk about like who they like discovered wrestling for. It was Dragon Gate because they come to these towns. And I think that that's kind of the brand that we have kind of seen. And we just see, more people at the forefront now, different faces, younger faces, and you start seeing people recede more into the woodwork until before you notice it, they're gone. Okay, I think that's a super interesting point that 100%, undeniably, from everything that you and I understand about the business of this company, house shows are drawn by the brand. It is... I, I, I'm i going to go out on a limb. I feel confident enough saying that Okay, New Japan comes to your town. You're going to that house show to see Okada or Tanahashi or Naito. Dragon Gate comes to your town for a non-televised house show. You are going to see Dragon Gate. Do you think that is a, a fair assessment of both of those brands? Yeah, and, and, and I think that probably there is something that you see people probably say that identify pro wrestling either as with how like things are marketed as like the Bushi Road companies or Dragon Gate just with how they've things are marketed i would say if what i sense. would like yeah what i would like to get to the bottom of and it just it's so hard to collect this data one because of covid but two because of just the weird drag gate schedule is okay so the brand draws on the road but then you're in corkin 14 times a year and you've got your big five shows what names are going to to make sure and again we'll just use non-covid numbers here what names at the top of the card are going to assure that it's an 1850 no vacancy full house in cork and hall and what is going to take what names are going to take an osaka show from 3000 to 4500 like that's what i really want to know and i we don't have that data right now because so many things have changed under covid this promotion has evolved to such a drastic degree in you know half capacity settings that i just don't know but going forward again, hopefully with things opening up and who knows, because again, things are getting pretty rough in the States right now. Uh, I, I don't know if we'll be able to have that data anytime soon, but I would really like to be able to figure that sort of stuff out. Oh yeah, no, for sure. That's the kind of stuff that I go nuts about being able to do that, but we'll see how things are looking in 2023. I think that's kind of, will be another good time for us to kind of take a step back and to kind of do those evaluations. I think by that point, we'll probably have a good indicator at least of how Japan's going to be holding uh, events going in the future. So I, I, I think it's something that we will see 
kind of the split attendance thing kind of continue. I don't have any reasoning to think that it just kind of seems that it's going to be a venue venue thing. And the question is, do you want to sell 700 tickets and cork in, or can you sell more than 700 tickets and it's not worth it for you? I would agree with all of that, Mike. Any final thoughts before we put a bow on this one? No, I think we're we're good here. Uh, we will talk later this week probably to figure out for next week because there's no uh, TV for Dragon Gate until the cork and that's happening on the 6th. And they have a pretty loaded month coming up. It's uh, without, even even without Gate Destiny, they're going to have two shows in Kobe Sambo Hall this next month and then they will have uh, their back at Across Fukuoka. So it's just... A little bit of break until then, but we will let y'all know about that. Uh, Anything else you want to touch on? I think that's it. All right. You can follow us at Open Voice Gate. If you subscribe to us through Apple Podcasts, go and toss us a five-star review or any other podcast aggregate. I mean, Google Podcasts, Spotify, wherever it is, we greatly appreciate it. You can follow Kesa underscore in your case, and you can follow me at Fujiheya. Thanks for listening to Open Voice Gate. We'll be back next week talking about Dragon Gate. Take care.